All right. Mic's on. Mic's hot. Uh, then the green button on the top right. Exactly. And then in the back of the machine is a butterfly switch. open the chamber. So this one has some stubs in there. You can just take off the um, like the last three, four, five, and six okay. and re replace them with those. Okay. And then we'll just put them right back in. Or you can actually re actually replace the first three. So like, so like one, two, and three? One, two, and three. Bear with us, peoples. Green light. That's the bottom one, right? Look at it. Yep. Should be loose by now. It's not really that tight. No? Hmm. It should only be like maybe two turns. <laughs> Am I going the right way? You want me to check? It's this whole righty tighty lefty loosey thing? Oh, I was doing that. Oh, were you in one of these? Yeah. Yeah, it's in this thing. It's not really that many turns. Oh, three's already empty. So this should be closed while you're working on it. Yeah. Just to keep the dust out. Where do you want these? Oh, um, just stick them over there somewhere. I'm making a pile of stuff I need to fix later. It's like, okay. uh, things that I should have Mallory do, I just haven't asked her to do because everybody's busy. Now we're just working on setting up the scanning electron microscope. So some new stubs that I'm putting in there that I made this morning that are hot out of the slide warmer, stub warmer. And um, we just sputter coated them. So I'm having my assistant Eleanor get some practice at mounting them in the carousel and then we'll be slipping them into the scanning electron microscope and turning the vacuum pump on. Thank you for a follow. I'm sure the anticipation is just killing everybody. Um, last night I did a little bit of a stream from my light microscope and um, these same materials 
and today we're going to look at them in the SEM. It's the same stuff I actually looked at on Saturday, but uh, this time we've processed the materials. So I'm hoping that they'll be clean. So just on the middle stub, yep, and rotate it so that the holes are aligned. Yep. Yep, and then just lightly tighten like everything else. Okay. Squeak, 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 squeak. And then we can close this. You should see the samples coming into your field of view now. And I can start pumping the scanning electron microscope's vacuum chamber down. Let's see, I'll put this in studio mode. And then... Things seem to be going well. Uh, we should have samples ready in about a minute. The vacuum uh, chamber is hooked up to... Oh, you do a lot of SCM work on fossil corals for your undergrad research? Cool. Um, hey, it's Comrade Bubbles. How are you doing, Bubbles? I'll give you a little shout out. I take care of my own shout outs sometimes, like an, like an adult. Instead of making my uh, assistants do it. Um, yeah, thanks for the follow, a Andrea. Uh, you know, in a second we'll be looking at some diatoms. Uh, it should be only diatoms in this sample. You replace them with one, two, and three? Yes. And then we'll have some SEM magic, hopefully. The uh, Shout out's not super effective with only three people here in the channel, but, uh, you know, I mean, I'll give you a, one later if we get some uh, more viewers. Um, the nitrogen tank that's hooked up to our vacuum chamber that um, pumps the air in to replace the vacuumed uh, conditions is almost out of nitrogen. And I think it may make it through the whole stream, but it also may not. So we may have to change the nitrogen tank in the middle of the stream, which will be fun. Um, I guess I could try to set it up so people could see what I'm doing, but it's not really that interesting to replace a nitrogen tank. Um, I just pull one out and take the, um, uh, the gauge off of it and then replace it on the new one and turn it on. So uh, it will only take like maybe five minutes out of the stream. So you haven't seen that yet before, have you? Okay, I'm going to, yeah, I should do this so you could see what's going on inside of the uh, thing instead of just looking at a blank screen. So, um, good morning, Andalore. How are you doing? We're, uh, we're getting ready to turn things on. Here it goes. So, oh, no. Looks like maybe the samples that I put on have a little bit of a coating from the acid. I must not have gotten all of it out of it which is what I was afraid of. So I don't know if they're gonna be any good because they look a little crusty. Let's see, maybe out here on the margins. It's like I got what I wanted, but what I didn't get was clean samples. I don't know, that looks okay. Some of them will probably be good. for the very sparse. So this is a part of a consequence of um, processing the materials. Uh, they, they came unprocessed and I thought they'd been processed. So I just mounted them without doing any additional work. And I thought, oh, they looked like they were clean samples, but they clearly hadn't been processed at all. And uh, I found that out when I was looking around in the actual samples. Uh, 
Uh, so we're looking for these giant diatoms. See, I think this is actually like a bit of the nitric acid uh, crystallization. I rinsed them a few times, but I maybe didn't get all of it out. And our giant diatoms may be trapped in some of that blebs of nitric acid. Also, once I clean them, they uh, there was much less on the slide. So, like when I was extracting the material from um, the sample, I probably should have concentrated a little bit more. So they're really sparse on the actual stubs, which is, you know, maybe a positive in some ways, but usually kind of a negative. So. Uh, but we'll get some good views of some of them anyway, and whether we get the thing we want is a totally different question. So, right here, what we're looking at is a diatom skeleton for the, um, it's from the genus Cymbella, and it's actually a sort of a subgroup of the genus Cymbella. Um, this is Cymbella, it's in the Mexicana group. And I can tell this from the shape of the pores, which have this sort of like X shape, or like a, a fat X, basically. And the light flipping on and off. And if uh, we could see the middle, which we can't very clearly, between these two pieces should be uh, a little opening, which is possibly that one, but I don't think so. I think that's just the rafy end. Uh, but it's like stuck right where we would want to see it uh, to be able to tell. And then they should have apical pore fields on the ends here somewhere. It's a little washed out because I have the intensity up too high. So that's a bit better. You can see the apical pore fields are a little busted out on these because they're kind of finer material. And um, one thing that happened earlier uh, this week when I saw that I was sort of running low on material from this site is I sent out a request on Twitter to my <laughs> science colleagues. Hey, is anybody near this site that could run out and grab me some material? <laughs> Just like a, a bat signal that I put up, like, hey, anybody anywhere near this site that could just send me some rocks? And I didn't have a lot of hope that that would work. Uh, but then I got a, um, an email last night. Uh, there was a person named Kaj Snow who was like, oh, I'm in Twin Falls and I'd like to have like a cool side thing to do while we're here and I'm going to be leaving tomorrow morning. So just tell me what you want. And uh, I just got another email from them. They went to the park and they collected the, some rocks for us. And they're <laughs> going to ship them to me. So um, I find this absolutely hilarious that like a total, basically total stranger uh, was willing to run out, uh, you know, like drive, drive out to a park and uh, stick their hand in the freezing cold stream and pull out some rocks for me. Uh, and I really hope they turn out to have exactly what we want on them because uh, that would be amazing. So, uh, sorry, the diatom that we're looking at right here is Ellerbeckia. And um, we're looking at the inside view of the diatom. So, like, um, diatoms have two cell walls, uh, like on each side of the valve, um, that break apart, which is where they get their name. Diatom means two pieces or two parts and everything is uh, really tiny, but the cell wall for diatoms are silicified. And um, so you could imagine uh, the, the thing is sort of like a capsule, like a, um, like a hat box or a Petri dish or whatever, and uh, it's a Pokeball if you'd like. And we're looking at the inside of our Pokeball, right? We're looking, looking at the curved interior part of it um, rather than the exterior. And um, we're actually still quite far away from our samples because I wasn't sure if any of these would actually have anything on them. But the Ellerbecki are pretty big, so we don't need to get a whole lot closer until I can uh, feel comfortable that we're actually going to see something valuable. This is uh, another diatom Cacanese and um, a genus Cacanese. 
And then these are some Rycosvenia up here on these little edges. Um, the thing I'm looking for is actually in the, it's in the same kind of broad family as this Rycosvenia. Um, it's known as Gomphenes. Um, and also there's another one that we think could be Gomphenes or potentially Gomphenema and very likely to be a uh, new species. So I've been in some sort of uh, excited conversation with one of my colleagues who studies these and, uh, and we've been, I've sort of been bouncing pictures back and forth with them as I get them. Uh, and I got some pretty cool pictures this morning from another sample, which we, I think is still on here. Um, uh, but this stub doesn't look so great. And maybe none of these ones from the this morning's collection will have anything useful on them. I'm not positive about it. So, uh, but it would be really hilarious if those rocks show up and then they have stuff on them. That would be amazing. So, just totally random person collecting science stuff for us and sending it to us, uh, you know, out of the goodness of their hearts. Uh, actually, this is one of the diatoms we wanted to find. This is uh, the Gonfanema one, and I can tell that um, because it has these two little holes, the stigma, that are here. And that is characteristic for the thing that we're looking at. It has two stigma. Uh, one thing that's kind of neat about it is it has a really wide range in sizes, I've found. So uh, our estimates for the size of these things that we've seen in the light microscope are generally it's somewhere between um, like 150 microns. And I think we've seen some that are about as small as 60. Um, from the SEM, we actually have tool sets where we could do measurements um, directly on the image while it's live. Oops, I don't want to analysis though, I want to just measure. So we can, for example, uh, just sketch on a line and then sketch on the other line on the other end and it'll tell us the distance between those two. So in this case, it's, you know, maybe that line's not perfect, but um, maybe it's about uh, 105 microns or something uh, for the length of this one, which puts it in the right size category for what we wanted. And then I can just get rid of that. Um, so I know that I'm kind of looking at the right specimen, the right, uh, potentially the right organism. And as a result, we should probably zoom in on this sample. So uh, right now we're at about uh, 20 millimeters away from, or two centimeters basically, away from um, the, the stubs which are inside the chamber. And I want to get closer. So I'm just going to move the stage up. It's going to vibrate the stage so it's kind of distorting the picture for a bit. And um, moving closer just makes it easier for us to magnify stuff a little bit, but it also simultaneously um, decreases the the depth of field. So I've moved us up to five millimeters between the specimen and um, the cone, uh, the pull piece for the scanning electron microscope. And that's actually um, usually where I like to operate with diatoms. I'm running at uh, 30 kilovolts for my accelerating voltage. Um, sometimes I like to do diatoms at a little bit, um, uh, not quite so high of a, um, accelerating voltage, sometimes I'll just turn it down to 5 or 10. Um, but I'm just going to leave it at 30 for now because it's kind of a pain in, uh, to switch it and then switch it back if we feel like we need to zoom in and see something very close. So um, I'm going to rotate the sample and then I'm going to be able to sort of jump over and see what's going on in chat and have some conversation because uh, usually while I'm running the SEM I can't do anything else and, and Eleanor didn't bring a computer to see what was going on. Um, uh, it's fine. You don't need to. I can handle it. Um, so this is an undergrad who's working in my lab, Eleanor. She's in her second semester, right? Yes. So, uh, and she's doing research on something else, not this. Um, I went the wrong direction. I want to go like 260, maybe? Uh, one of the things that's really nice about the test scan uh, Vega 3 is that I can just rotate stuff around and it keeps track of my position. I went too far and I want it like more like a 270. So I'm just trying to maximize my, uh, 
my viewing dimension of the diatom so I can get close as possible to it. And uh, it looks like maybe it's a 275, right? a little bit farther rotated than I am. So I can just rotate it and it'll spin it and we'll reposition it so that I'm back where I left it off, um, even though I've, uh, I'm, uh, I'm on the outside edge of our carousel. So it, it does a bunch of calculations for me, makes decisions about where it should move it, and then moves us there. And so that's cool. It will also recalculate our position if I try to tilt the stage. So that is also a, uh, another cool feature of this. So normally when I go to take a picture of diatoms or anything in the scanning electron microscope, the trick is to zoom in. Get as close as you can get that you think you can get a reliable image from it and focus it up tight on that image. And then once you have the sort of tight focus that you want, uh, make the adjustments that you want to make. So in this case, I want to decrease the beam intensity to seven and that will actually um, make my image quality improve. And then I want to decrease the speed so that we're back into something that's a little bit slower. You can see the scanning electron microscope kind of build the image as it goes. Um, but I don't want um, that to be our final uh, image. I, I want to have a different composition still. So I'm just going to get it um, sort of set so that the composition is, uh, so that the focus is good and the um, contrast and the brightness are correct. And then I'm going to zoom out and compose it a little bit um, to try to get it like exactly how I want it. And then uh, I'll just take a picture. So you can see the difference um, as it's scanning across before and after the brightness contrast settings have been met. And um, now that I know that it's going to be basically what I want, then I'll zoom out and switch the speed back to what I was setting it to, which was seven. And as a result, we should get a nice clean image. One of the things I would say though is uh, it looks like um, as a result of zooming out, these outside edges are a little brighter than I'd like. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do the brightness contrast thing one more time, let it recalculate those. And I might actually move it just a hair uh, closer towards that end before I take the picture so we get a nice um, centered view uh, where I can maximize the magnification. So currently the diatom that we're looking at is being magnified by 3,100 times. A typical light microscope has a maximum magnification of about a thousand times and you can oftentimes digitally enhance those images and make them better. But, um, uh, but the resolution never improves. So you're just basically blowing it up. You're not actually like improving the quality. So I think this looks, look, it's looking pretty sharp. And so I'm just going to uh, tweak it a little bit with respect to its position. And then finish the sort of composition. Set the speed and hit the take a picture button. So now it's taking a picture. It will draw for us and I can actually look at what's everybody doing in here. So um, let's see. Uh, Andalor, I'm trying to fix the oopsie in a database system. Well, that sounds challenging. Um, uh, Astro Canuck, hello, how are you doing? Uh, good to catch the stream from the start. You'll be in and out tonight. So Astro Canuck is a fellow streamer. They, um, they're not actually, I guess they might be Canadian, but they're not actually in Canada. Um, I think they're based in London. So, um, uh, Neo Goo and Alpha Bio, Alpha Wolf, say hello, how you doing? And um, Billy Galaxy Art, a bunch of streamers sort of showed up early. Chef J Tay is here as well, hello. And Minervus, are you Minervus? Um, I'm gonna give a shout out to some of my peeps that are here. Uh, Astro Canuck, you should definitely give them a follow and uh, see what they've been up to. We give a little shout out to our buddy Bubbles. Hello, come man, comrade Bubbles. And then um, Billy Galaxy Art. It's like we got a bunch of streamers in here at the beginning of our stream. Everybody's curious what's going on. Um, all bunch of people you should definitely check out. And 
don't know. Chef Jayte, are you also a streamer? I haven't seen any of your streams yet. I'm so far behind catching up on all of the, uh, uh, like, catching up with people that follow me because uh, once you start getting a lot of followers, it's really hard to kind of, like, track every person who follows you back to the source and add them, make sure they're a streamer. If I, if they, I typically do that, I'll go back through and look and see if they're streamers. I try to add them so I can see what they do as well. Um, so if that's the case, let us know. I think you've been here before, but um, I, I didn't catch you on the follow. So uh, this is a diatom. It's asymmetric. In other words, if we were to try to um, create it by, um, in, you know, like in elementary school, we made snowflakes where you'd fold the piece of paper and then you'd cut the piece of paper. So um, for diatoms, we do a similar sort of thing. We try to figure out, are they um, symmetrical or asymmetrical by how many times we'd have to fold the paper, right, to get uh, a diatom as a snowflake with just like cutting it once. So um, if it's uh, if it's symmetrically, if it's sort of bilaterally symmetrical, that means we would fold the paper once and then a second time and then cut along the fold, you know, across the fold. And um, we could use that to um, uh, unfold it and make a diatom, right? So we could uh, basically fold it along the axis and across the axis and it would be symmetrical. Um, that's a certain group of diatoms that we would um, have that would fall into that sort of system. And um, this is the Gumpho monster. Gumpho monster, that's what I've been calling it, because I don't know where it belongs actually with respect to its genus yet. And I need an internal view to help me figure that out, and I haven't been able to find one. So, um, uh, but. Uh, if you could only fold it along one axis, like the one that we're looking at right now, we could fold it along the axis, but we couldn't fold it across the axis because this end is not shaped the same as this end. They may look kind of similar, but um, this end's longer and this end is a little bit fatter, right? So skinny and, um, and as a result, it's sort of shaped like a submarine or, I don't know, what would you think that's, a bowling pin? No, because it's not curvy enough at the top. Well, like, Okay, it's not exactly a bowling pin. Mine but. look like bowling pins. Oh, I see how we are. <laughs> Yours are bowling pins. That's not a bowling <laughs> pin. Let me show you what a bowling pin looks like. Like that? Uh, let's see, I'm gonna make some minor adjustments. And then, ta-da. So we are streaming from uh, my scanning electron microscope lab. I actually have two labs, one that mostly holds uh, normal microscopes and students and a hood and an oven and a refrigerator and other science equipment like scales and that sort of thing. And then, uh, and then I have this lab that is my microscope uh, from my scanning electron microscope lab. And um, it's on the other side of the same building, but um, uh, both are equally mine to use at my discretion. So. Uh, useful and uh, and I'm currently um, so here's another one of those what's that? it's an Ellerbeckia it's not a very big one though um, but that's on the valve face before we were looking at the inside and that's the outside of one it's a little tiny Ellerbeckia this is a gumf uh, a cockanese a broken one these things are Grunawia, which is sort of in between uh, Nitzia and um, in between Nitzia and Denticula, and then uh, so some other diatom genera. For all you diatom experts out there um, who are super curious what we're looking at. people who've been around in the channel for a while might start to be able to um, recognize different uh, <laughs> species or genera of diatoms if we see them frequently enough, I suppose. This is a Grunawia. Kind of cool. They look better in the light microscope in some ways because uh, they kind of look like out of bubble, bubbled uh, inside of the valve. So one of the things about the sample is uh, uh, the sample was collected by just sort of sticking a jar in some water and uh, and then sending it to me, ultimately. Um, so 
Grunalia again. And um, that's not the best way to capture things that are uh, like these. Most of these, <laughs> most of these diatoms are benthic. They live on the bottom. They live attached to rocks, and uh, or they live in like colonies uh, where they attach to other diatoms or um, or plants. And um, uh, so when you give me a water sample, it'll just have the ones that got ripped off of those substrates and then are entrained in the water. And um, so they're, they're not, it's not actually an ideal way for me to get a lot of um, the diatoms that I'm interested in. So instead I've got like this sort of um, really sparse samples with not a lot in them and, uh, and so the thing that we're looking at shows up infrequently, um, which is why I asked somebody to get me some rocks from uh, a stream in Idaho and uh, somehow that worked. <laughs> I, I, uh, I guess I could name the diatom after that person as a, uh, as a reward, uh, or maybe we'll just uh, give them some sort of credit in the paper for finding us samples if it actually has anything in it that's useful. Um, this is pretty funny though. This looks like the thing that we want, but it's buried under a pile of, uh, of this chemical stuff. And I think that's actually the nitric acid that's dried onto the, um, the stub. So I just didn't get enough of it washed out, which is weird because I actually took a lot of, uh, a really large percentage of it out. It's just like a little bit of it, but it's enough to, um, to stick around in the samples. So, uh, it's unfortunate, but happens. I just need to be a little more careful. It was one of the reasons why I didn't have you take all of the stubs off and just have these ones in there, because I did know for sure that we'd have uh, quality diatoms to look at if I did that. Um, the real problem is that if I don't process them, then uh, they often stay articulated the valves basically stay stuck together and I need to see what they look like on the inside uh, in order to describe them. So I keep thinking, oh, I'll just do this and then it'll solve that problem. Uh, and then every time I try something, it's not doing exactly what I wanted. Um, uh, I have another student who'll be here in a bit. She's in class, Rihanna, who's actually working on uh, this project with me, trying to describe these species. And uh, both of them, probably. And she's also learning how to use a micro manipulator, which is a device that you can use to essentially pick up diatoms and move them around and reposition them. And we have one in our lab uh, that we haven't really been using because uh, nobody's trained to use it. And um, we still need to sort of find some uh, probes and other tools to attach to it that will work for what we want. So this is a little clean Rykosphenia we could zoom in on. So we're not just looking for one diatom type and then being disappointed when we don't find it. So uh, Rykosphenia are really cool ends to them. They have uh, an apical pore field, so a little pore field at the end of the diatom that they use to squeeze out um, uh, uh, extracellular polysaccharides to create little stalks, and they use them to attach. So this is a diatom that likes to grow a little stalk and attach to things like rocks, and they are specialists that like to live in flowing water. So um, uh, as I mentioned, we, we find them um, attached to rocks in the flowing water, so it's sort of important for us to uh, to look at the rocks, right? That's why I had somebody send me that rather than... Um, I'm going to guess it was actually 260 that I want, something like that. Ah. A little bit better than the first try. And then I can zoom in. It can give us a nice picture of our little Rykosphenia. So Rykosphenia are kind of unique amongst all of the asymmetric diatoms in that they are curved. You see this sort of valve face is curved and the back valve face is curved. 
Um, but the, we're looking at it in girdle view. We're looking at it basically from the side, um, not from the top. And so you can see that um, the curved face usually has the raphe, and then the uncurved or the broadly curved back of it has like a little tiny short little raphe um, that we can't see either of them right now. Um, and they grow attached to a little stalk or, or uh, a bit of EPS coming out of the bottom side here. Um, but they can crawl around a bit or stay attached to uh, other diatoms or whatever uh, using their raphe. So they need to reposition themselves they can. Diatoms are kind of cool like that because people don't usually think of algae being able to crawl. Um, but uh, diatoms have that sort of agency where they can basically make decisions like I'm in a bad condition for where I want to be and reposition themselves into a new one and then uh, attach there, right? So if they are in an area that dries out and they don't want to be uh, dried out or they want to move to an area that's got more light, they can actually do that. Maybe the area they're in is too crowded, um, so they'll just find a new place to, to live. It's pretty good. So we'll just go ahead, drop the beam intensity down where we want it. I like the tiny holes, like down there. These ones? Oh, down the sides of yeah, the, these are the actual cool. girdle bands. Okay. So the girdle band, there's a girdle band attached, one attached to each of the valve faces. So this one has a little band like a duct tape roll or something that goes around the outside edge of it. And this one also has one that's attached to it. And they interfinger with each other. So if you look down here, you can see this one is sort of overlaps. So here's the valve face. Mm -hmm. Here's the, um, the girdle band. So the row of dots for this girdle band belong to the valve face on the, um, the this side. Okay. And the row of dots that are on this girdle band belong to the valve face on this side. Uh -huh. And then the two are basically like sort of yeah. interleaved with each other. Um, so that's just sort of the way that they're, uh, they're structured to uh, hold the valve together. So like that's how the lid fits on, right? Effectively, they have to have a sort of a tight fitting lid. So I'm going to take a picture. We'll get this Rikosphenia in girdle view and I can then see what's the chat saying. Oh my gosh, it's Tropical Geek, and they're super <laughs> excited because Ellie's here. Hey. And uh, let's see. Oh. Uh, Minerva says, does it take pretty beast computer to run that electron microscope? No. Um, graphic card has got to be pretty good, and this one does have a pretty good graphics card, but it doesn't have to be like a monstrous uh, high-end computer. Um, uh, what the, uh, I should go look and see what it actually is. Um, I guess I could do that while it's trying to take the picture. I've never actually even looked at the specs. Oh yeah. All right, Bye. we'll catch you later. Uh, you got at least to check in with people and say hi. Thanks for hanging out with me. And uh, let's see, it's a uh, i3. So uh, a three, see you, 3.9 gigahertz, something like that. And it's got about eight gigabytes of RAM. So if you're just wondering, uh, it's not a um, ridiculously high-end computer that's required for it. All right, so since Ellie's gone, I can stretch my beard. That'll be nice. Um, Chef JJ, I found you through other channels. I'm on, oh, oh, Pacific Plankton's channel. Yeah, okay. I thought that the name sounded familiar, but uh, Sarah, how are you doing? There's lots of snowflakes outside I could take pictures of. I know. Um, you know, the thing is that uh, I make sacrifices, and one of the sacrifices I'm making is I can either stream or I can go do, like, cool photography stuff. And uh, I'm kind of excited to see what I had in this sample. So I'm a little more excited to stream my SEM than I am to take snowflake pictures. So snowflakes are often like, um, like here because the temperature isn't quite cold enough. They're kind of trashy. So they've got like a bunch of granules of ice growing on them and stuff. Um, are the diatoms in here dead? Yeah, everything in the chamber is dead. Uh, it's in a vacuum. So if it wasn't dead before we started, it's definitely dead now. Um, 
something is different there in the lab. It looks like wood in the back. Oh, it's just because the camera's turned. There's actually cabinets that have always been there. Um, but, you know, the, the camera moves around. So uh, I was trying to make sure Ellie could be in the field of view so you could see her. So um, how does it make decisions if it doesn't have a brain? Uh, well, yeah, it's a storage cabinet. Um, uh, Minerva's diatoms will make decisions based off of uh, instinct. So they have... Um, like, like how does that earthworm make a decision or how does an insect make a decision? Um, it's mostly they respond to chemical and physical properties in the environment. So uh, if nutrients are low or if um, water is missing or if they want more light, um, they can sense their environment around them without having a brain. They're single-celled organisms, but they are phototactic and chemotactic. And, um, and they can basically make response. They can, they have an agency, they can move. Um, it doesn't require t uh, like real decision-making. They just instinctively know like this is not a setting that I want to be in and they move to a new setting. So, um, you know, I, uh, I don't know how that um, happens on a microscopic level, but it does. Um, Arcosphenia, I think it's curvata. Uh, girdle view. Sorry, I got to do some bookkeeping on my end. And then uh, I can close this one. Zoom back out. Uh, so I tend to personify diatoms a little bit. Um, they, they don't have uh, personalities. They're algae. But um, it's easier for me to think of them that way. So uh, if you're annoyed by my personification of them, always keep in mind that the uh, they're single-celled organisms. They don't, they don't really think or decide things. Um, but it's easier to think of them as doing that, um, to give them that sort of sense. They do have agency, though. I mean, they do make decisions about where they want to go um, in the sense that uh, this is bad. I need to move, right? Um, it's just it's more like an instinctual decision, not like a thinking decision, cognitive behavior. Um, mostly probably related to conditions are low or bad for me with respect to being in an environment, right? So, um, but if you do look at diatoms, if you collect water samples that have diatoms in them and you're looking at them in a light microscope, um, like they'll actually move in response to the light. Um, uh, some things will happen, basically, associated with where they are positioned on the slide. They'll crawl around if they can, um, either to get into brighter light or get out of hot water, because uh, microscopes tend to heat up uh, the water that's on, or oil that's on the slides. Um, and so, uh, you know, they, they somehow they recognize that's not a place that, that's going to be beneficial for them, and they move. So, um, if they couldn't benefit themselves by moving, they wouldn't move, right? So they're in a good place. They're not going to go anywhere. Think of it like that. That's a pretty simple way of thinking of it. Yeah, I'm going to have to remake some more of these slides. I thought I was, I thought I was going to get it this time for sure, but I don't see any internal views and everything is super sparse. So um, it's a good thing I had Ellie help me and, uh, and left some of the other material on there because then I can just hop over to one of those, which will be um, much more material, but you can see the difference between them is uh, these samples have a bunch of debris on them. Uh, so this was the, the uh, trade-off that I made is that effectively um, I was getting rid of all this junk, this organic junk that's on here that I'm not interested in. And uh, I was trying to trade it for nice pretty diatoms uh, that are broken apart. So the diatom that we just looked at, um, that I took a picture of, Roycosphenia curvata is here, and then um, there's some other diatom valves that are present on here. We're looking for big things, like this guy's a big thing, and um, so this would be the one, I don't know, I don't think this is actually the one we just looked at, but it, no because uh, it should have two little dots here that are separated from the rest of everything else. 
So this is just another gomphonema that's in the sample, I guess. Uh, again, it's kind of big. So, uh, roughly the size that we want. But what we really want is an internal view. So it's important for us to get inside and outside views of things. Yeah, that's an interesting shot of something, but the insides are totally messed up as the girdle bands fell into the actual sample. So we can't really see what's going on in there. Not helpful. Um, this is a game, so if you never used a scanning electron microscope before, this is part of the game, which is trying to find stuff. Like, you get these great views sometimes of things, but oftentimes it's hours of searching around, trying to find the thing that you're hoping to get, especially when they're microscopic organisms, because uh, they're just sort of strewn around on the slide, and, um, and it's sort of random whether they're there or not. So I have, sometimes I'll have a stub where uh, there are, you know, maybe five of them and another stub where there's none at all. And I'm just like, uh, you know, like it's just percentages. It's like a chance that it might land on there and be face up and be oriented the way that you want. And um, so it ends up being like a lot of, well, we'll just move around and see what we can find and hopefully we'll catch one, right? That's shaped the way we want facing the way we want and um, also hopefully doesn't have a bunch of junk on it where we're trying to look so um, these uh, bigger diatoms that we're looking for that are in here or potentially in here are also uh, the bigger they are it's also usually the less common they are um, so a bunch of little things you can see all over the place that are diatoms, but are not the diatom that we're looking for. So um, that adds to the challenge of finding them, which is basically that um, we're already looking at the like rarest subset of things. And um, in the normal environment. So um, this is an assemblage of diatoms that are found together uh, in the sample that was collected. But in practice, if we were actually to get like the rock samples and they had stuff on them um, that we wanted to, to uh, image, the diatoms probably be very common in those because um, that's their habitat that they prefer rather than looking at this one, which is like stuff that gets washed out of that habitat. This is kind of a cool image. One of the other issues with not cleaning the samples is you get to see diatoms that are attached living on the valve face of other diatoms. So that's a uh, cockney sitting right there on top of this Ellerbeckia, and it's attached itself to it. And because we didn't process the sample, it's still stuck there by a little bit of, you know, organic matter. So um, there's some pros and cons to, uh, to doing that. Oh, I got a ding ding noise. What was that? I'm being raided. It's shoe. Hello, Shu. Uh, welcome, Raiders. Welcome to the stream. And um, uh, hopefully, uh... <laughs> hopefully you're having a good day today. Um, uh, VK4, VK4. When you use SEM on diatoms, do they die? They dead. They were dead before I started. Uh, we're in a, we're in, in a vacuum. Uh oh. I gotta turn the volume down. Or else I'm gonna be good news to everyone. Um, yeah, so th they're all dead in there already. Um, uh, in this case, they were collected. Probably most of them were dead when they were collected as well. Uh, they're just sort of floating around in the, in the water. Um, why the vacuum though? Wouldn't it be better to see them interacting rather than kill them? So um, the SEM only works in a vacuum. There's no other way for it to work because um, we're not using light. We are using electrons to see things and uh, scanning electron microscopes necessarily have to work in a vacuum because the electron beam, that's, um, that's the thing that's actually allowing us to see, that's replacing light in this scenario, the electron beam 
can only beam onto the subject if there's not things between uh, the source of the beam and the target of the beam. So if I put water or something else, like these diatoms normally would live in water, if I put that between my sample and the beam, all the electrons would be deflected off the water rather than off the diatoms. So I wouldn't be able to observe them at all if they were in their living conditions, which is like in a pool of water somewhere. Um, we wouldn't be able to even image them. So um, you wouldn't see anything. If you wanted to see how diatoms were living and interacting in their environment like that, you'd use a light microscope, not a scanning electron microscope. So you just pick a different tool for that. Um, your, your question about why should I uh, kill them to look at them? Well, diatoms are uh, a type of algae and they um, reproduce by asexually by cloning themselves. So think of them more like stormtroopers uh, where they're clones and uh, losing a few of the clones doesn't really matter. So, um, you know, we don't probably don't want to kill things intentionally if we can help it. But most of these were probably dead in the water that they were floating through. Um, they became detached from a surface they were on and were going to be carried out of the water system that they were living in. And ultimately probably would have just been deposited somewhere and buried under a pile of dirt. So um, it's pretty unlikely that um, because none of these are actually plankton, they, pr they probably weren't living in the water. They probably were very disappointed that they got dislodged from some happy surface that they were on, or they just uh, died naturally and then got carried away by a stream. And um, so, but it, uh, back to that point, um, one, I wouldn't be able to see them if they were in their natural environment uh, in the scanning electron microscope. I have a light microscope. I could look at them in a light microscope, but when I got them, they were already dead. So it's not like, it's not like I killed them. Um, they, were, they were dead when they arrived in my lab. But, um, uh, but additionally, because they're clones, diatoms can replicate in ideal conditions up to eight times in one day. So if you could make like um, uh, a 256 copies of yourself uh, in the span of a week or something like that. Am I really doing a lot of damage by taking a few out of that scenario? Um, probably not. So uh, we don't usually think of organisms like diatoms, which are algae, as, um, you know, it doesn't have vertebrae, it's, it's single-celled, so people don't usually have like a lot of feelings about diatoms, like with respect to we shouldn't kill them um, just to look at them. But, um, but I'd actually argue that these ones probably I didn't kill. Well, I didn't do it, uh, but I mean, they probably weren't killed in the name of science. So if you're worried that our, um, our clones that we're seeing here um, are somehow being damaged by me, that probably isn't the case. Um, but uh, the, the fossils, the skeletons of what, we were, what was once alive is basically what we're looking at. So uh, to keep that in mind, so... Um, it's not like I've sacrificed a bunch of diatoms for, uh, for some scientific evil plot. I definitely did not. So, um, this is the diatom, uh, one of the two diatoms that we were, uh, looking at that I'm interested in. And this one is a gomphonese. I know what its genus is. Um, and I know that because in the light microscope, it's clear where it belongs. Um, it has a septa and it has an axial plate, which we haven't been able to actually image. And then they have these really interesting uh, horns, which are uncommon, like extremely uncommon for, um, for Gomphonema and Gomphonese. Um, I've got some other diatoms with horns that are in the same group or a similar group, but from Africa. And uh, these are the little horn projections coming off of the front end of these things and you can only see them in girdle view uh, or if the diatom is sort of at a weird angle. And I have some that I collected earlier today at that weird angle. So I don't actually even need these. I have some nice pictures of them from um, the other day. And uh, I wanted to get a picture of the apical pore field on these, but that is also kind of damaged on these. So um, I'll just look around for a better specimen, which is, you know, again, a consequence of uh, just having junk strewn on a slide is that Sometimes whoop, there's another specimen right there. Sometimes it's hard to uh, find something that's preserved in, in 
the right quality. So this is, um, you can tell this is that other gonfanema though, because when we look closely at it, we see the striae are a little bit different and um, at the head pole up here, they don't have that sort of weird little horn sticking up off of them, which is characteristic for that other species. So uh, careful observation, we can tell that these are not the same um, diatom species as that other one, but close. I need to rotate the opposite direction. And I'm just trying to get it so I can kind of get a chunk of it aligned and get the biggest possible field of view, which seems to be that orientation. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit on just this part, try to get that focus nice and tight. And uh, you can see some of these great structures that are associated with uh, diatoms. So these little holes that you're seeing right here are called areoli. They are openings to the outside world from the cell wall. So they use it to collect nutrients and, uh, and remove wastes and that sort of thing. So communication with the outside. And then um, this is a girdle band. So you can see, as I mentioned, they overlap a little bit here. You can see the girdle band associated with this uh, diatom and the girdle band associated with this diatom uh, valve. So this valve and this valve both have their own girdle bands. And uh, the dots are again associated with the side that they're on. And I'm gonna set the speed to something a little bit clearer so you can see the images in here. And beam intensity is fine. And I think the brightness contrast settings are okay, but I'm gonna give it a poke and see how it goes. Um, but each one of these um, little groups of holes are called striae. So that just means, it's Latin for stripe. Um, it's just a stripe that basically, um, in the light microscope, they just look little, little stripes. In the scanning electron microscope, where we can get zoomed in to 8,000 times their size, um, we can actually see that they're little tiny holes that are composing these stripes. And, uh, and actually even the patterns associated with those holes, which often help us figure out what the genus or species that we're, of the organism that we're looking at is. So everything's good. I can take a picture and then I can go back. And again, I want to say thanks to Shu for the raid. Uh, thanks for bringing your people over. And um, uh, let's see. Uh, do, the, uh, do you use these to reconstruct paleo environments or do you primarily use the diatoms to study the diatoms myself? I actually do both, uh, Andrea. I'm uh, a bit of a taxonomist a bit of an ecologist, but I'm mostly a paleoecologist. So I would say that like most of my publications, if you went and looked through my publications in ResearchGate, if you go down and look in the uh, sort of about section below, um, you can get access to some of the uh, publications that I do. I would say maybe 90% of them are paleoecology papers, something like that. And uh, more recently, I've been doing a bit more taxonomic work. Um, and I sometimes publish in ecological kind of papers as well. So a, a mix, a pretty clear mix of those. Um, Sherlock, hello, am I all alone today? Um, well, Eleanor was here and then she left because she had class at two. And um, Rihanna is currently in class and told me she would be here when she was finished with whatever it is they were doing. So probably in the next half hour or something, we should get a, a visit from Rihanna. Um, this is a project that Rihanna is actually working on with us. We haven't seen Rihanna on stream for a while, um, other than just in the chat. So that'll be nice. Um, uh, LH Photo says this is wild. Well, it's pretty fun uh, using the scanning electron microscope to take pictures. Um, it's something that we do. And uh, the scans are coming along nicely. So thanks for dropping in and bringing your people. Shoot. And um, spam those emotes if you got them. Um, they reproduce asexually. Yeah. Uh, they do. Um, let's see. I'm not beyond damaging some clones. No. If I have to, uh, in order to describe some new species or characterize them or potentially preserve them for science, um, you know, we can get rid of some clones. We can kill some stormtroopers. It's fine. So, um, again, me says, hi, when they clone, are they individualizing their functions and strengthening the function as a group? Um, some of them 
clone themselves and live in colonies. Some of them clone themselves and just reproduce for the sake of reproducing because they want to, you know, preserve their genes. So, um, but they will be smaller as they reproduce because um, they form new valves inside of their old valves. And so one of the offspring is usually just a little bit smaller than the, um, the parent. And so the two daughter cells that are created have one of each parent's valve and then one valve that forms inside of each one of the parent's valves. And like in this image, one of those valves is slightly smaller because the girdle bands kind of stack in between each other. So if you formed inside of the girdle band stack, right, when the valves sort of expand outward, then you're a little bit smaller. And every time you do that, one of them is going to take one of those valves. So the small valve is constantly producing something that's a little bit smaller. And, uh, and they get smaller and smaller as time goes on. And then eventually they switch to sexual reproduction. So when, they, uh, when they've completed that sort of size cycle. So we end up with a sort of size series associated with diatoms where um, the babies are big and the old ones, uh, the sexy ones that are old are small. So uh, they can switch to sexual reproduction only when they get to sort of a certain size range. Um, and then these are those little holes that uh, are on the girdle bands that Eleanor said she liked. And you can see these ones actually are little like C-shaped holes and that one's kind of an S shape. It's like it's got a little alphabet going on right here along the edge of the diatom valve, which is pretty cool. Um, so this is a gonfo monster. And this is the girdle view head pole. So the head pole is the the top end of the diatom where it doesn't attach and um, we can actually go now to the bottom part of this diatom and look at the foot pole so we have a head pole where the uh, where the top of the diatom is or where the part that's away from the um, where it attaches so they don't actually have feet but we think of it as being like where it attaches as being the foot right so we're gonna, we're gonna try to crawl the screen up a little bit so we can get down to the foot pole and you can see that the foot pole is distinguished from um, the head pole, but it has a whole series of these little tiny, little tiny holes like a salt and pepper shaker uh, or um, a sewer grating or something like that, if you'd like. And um, uh, you can see both sides right here have those. Uh, and usually this is the part where they squeeze out the um, sort of um, polysaccharide material, a sort of sugary goo um, that they normally keep inside the valve and they use these to create long stalks that they attach to so if you go look at my Twitter feed from uh, last night I actually had a picture of one of these in the light microscope um, where they were in the life position and you could see the uh, EPS basically that creates the stalk so I went ahead and posted that into Twitter um, so if you were if you're curious about it it's in probably if you click on the Twitter link down below um, in the about section, you'll actually see that picture, among other things associated with my Twitter account. So uh, we're going to do the same thing. We've got basically the same uh, field of view. We've got a little bit. Of, it's a little bit wrecked here because um, uh, there's junk on one side and it's broken on the other. But um, it's still better than nothing for having a characterization of the foot pole. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that. If we find another one, we can always use it, and then I can come back and see, hey, what's been going on back here, right? So, um, let's see. Uh, oh, we got a squad command. So if you're interested in checking out some of our my fellow um, uh, microscope streamers on Twitch, um, all those people on that list use microscopes um, on and off. Although the one thing I keep forgetting to fix is that it is actually now, her name is um, Freckled Science, is what she's going by, um, rather than Frecked Chemist, so she changed her name. And uh, you should give her a follow. She's not on today, maybe, um, she's on pretty frequently in the evenings right now. So I can go check and see if she's actually on right now, but she's uh, she streams quite frequently. so. Um, and no, she's not on, so, uh, all good. Uh, sorry, so, uh, I want to thank those people who followed, um, uh, early on before at the very part, uh, early partest of the stream, it was, uh, Andrea Lemer, and then, uh, we had a big raid by Shu, bringing in 31, uh, people, and I think associated with, uh, Shu's, uh, introduction of them to me, we have a couple of new follows, um, so this was App Sue. 
um, Raven Star, uh, Kurt Bilner, and we just got a new follow from Il I Ilker? Ilker Senart. Um, so welcome in all those people. We're looking at some diatoms from a water power plant um, downstream of water power plant that was collected from some of the water um, from a place in Idaho called Niagara Springs, which has actually got a state park adjacent to it. You can go and visit. And uh, a random person on Twitter, I asked them recently, like last night, hey, is anybody around this park that could collect me some more of this material? And, uh, and they said yes and emailed me today with like a, uh, where do you want me to send these rocks I collected for you? So um, I'm pretty excited by that um, for a number of reasons. Um, one, it's sort of like crowdsourced a field collection um, from, from the site. And the two rocks are going to have a lot more of these on them than a water sample. So hopefully um, we'll find some of these and then I'm going to be super, super excited to, um, to be able to have a whole bunch of it rather than just a couple of sparse um, specimens that are showing up in the samples. So, um, my friend Anna sent me these and, uh, she was looking at them for some environmental analysis and, uh, this is the foot pole, girdle view, foot pole, um, and, uh, and she, uh, saw this one, the one that we're looking at that I'm calling Gumfo Monster, uh, and said, oh, I don't know what this is. Do I have any idea what it is? And I said, go ahead and send me some SEM uh, material that I can use for the SEM and, uh, and I'll put them on. And then uh, on Saturday, when we were looking around at the sample, I saw some of those valves and I thought, is that it? Um, I just wasn't sure. And, uh, and I saw this other thing uh, in here that I took samples of as well, the Gonfa Nice that we took a picture of. Um, so I took some sample pictures of both and then I went home with them and stared at them for a while and decided they were two different species first and, um, and second that one of them was the one that she actually had and the other one was something new so or something different and then uh, like really over the span of like every day I've been sending pictures to one of my colleagues who studies them and then having them uh, sort of respond with increasing interest every time uh, as they look through their materials and try to figure out what the species are and they don't think that they, you know, they don't think that they're described species. So we'll be describing them probably. Um, this is a different diatom. This is uh, not a gumphonema or even a gumphonemoid, um, but it's kind of related. This is um, Cymbella and it's Cymbella that belonged to the group Mexicana. So Cymbella Mexicana was the original species that um, then spawned a bunch of varieties that are similarly shaped. I think this one might actually be the nominate variety, the Mexicana Mexicana. And uh, this is a stigma that shows up between the two uh, raphe. So the raphe runs basically along the axis in this diatom. And uh, internally the stigma has this sort of like bumpy shape. So it's kind of cool. You can actually see the stigma and the bumpy shape associated with it. I suspect eventually somebody will come along and split these out from Cymbellas into their own genus because there's enough of them that are pretty different from the rest of the Cymbellas. Uh, they, structurally, they don't look quite the same and their pores don't look the same. And so um, a lot of things in the diatom world, when people start really looking closely at it, they decide that it's like a whole group of these things which kind of cluster together and then they probably belong in a, at the genus level separated from other things that are you know not quite as similar um, but there's uh, it's sometimes difficult to figure out whether you should be um, keeping them together or separating them so it just kind of depends on how the science society makes decisions about um, what they're seeing and then um, genetically how close they are to each other as well. Sometimes now that we have genes to kind of support our um, skeletal interpretations. So um, this is a big colony of Ellerbeckia. Earlier, somebody asked me, do they replicate sometimes to, um, to, to grow as a colony? 
Um, some diatoms like this one grow in big long colonies. So you can see, if we kind of zoom in uh, here, uh, the individual cells are separated um, and they're basically like telescoping out from the middle, right? So that bigger one is out here. Then uh, there's sort of a sheath and the next layer where it drops in is this one. And then there's sort of a sheath and then this one pops out, right? So um, in, in, this one matches with that one, this one matches with that one. Um, and then there's a cell that's in here that's in between them. And uh, so this is the oldest of those sequence and the most recently um, created through replication. And we can get a nice clean view of it. The valve face of Ellerbeckia, which is um, uh, often exemplified by this uh, wiggly joint uh, connection between them um, also has a valve face kind of like a poker chip on the other side so they have like poker chips and then these um, really tightly coupled um, spine combinations so we can see the um, the whole sort of assembly here in girdle view and if I zoom out a little bit you can see that that pattern is then repeated down here right and then we have uh, these patterns, which are split between the two valves in between them. So we can actually see that structure pretty well, um, really only in the scanning electron microscope. So it's like a, um, some characters we can only see, and sometimes they're really critical characters, but we can only see them in a scanning electron microscope with diatoms. So um, that's part of the value of me having one for me um, is that I can actually look at these and go, oh, here's the something that's different from other things. Um, but we can actually see how they uh, match up uh, across generations on this thread. And then um, I think on one end, so this is a really long colony, we just keep moving along. Um, uh, if I zoom out, so we'll look at this piece right here, but I just wanted to zoom out and show you. Um, there's some diatoms attached to the outside of this colony. These are coccinese, which are a different uh, genus even uh, than this one that's just attached to it. And if we zoom in on this end, um, you can see some of those ridges that are used to join the valves together um, that are present in some of the spots up here, um, exposed on the valve face right here. And um, the other end has an opening, so I think when I saw this end, it didn't have the valve face. Yeah, so this is one that got ripped in half, and we're only seeing half of a valve. There's the face uh, here, and here's the half of the valve, and the other half got ripped apart from uh, from it. So, um, and then here's the coccinese growing on that valve, right? So pretty cool uh, structure that we can see. Um, again, readily in the SEM, right? So this is kind of, kind of a cool little repeating pattern um, that I wanted to characterize a bit better. So uh, just for funsies, not a science photo necessarily, but um, something to... Uh, sometimes I just want some sort of artsy photography associated with uh, how these things look. So I'm trying to find a good composition. That's probably good. Okay. So we can zoom in really closely. We can see these differences in the pore structures between the girdle bands and the actual valves for the diatom. And I can zoom back out and I can get that same kind of resolution um, but from a distance by decreasing my speed, my beam intensity is already set and we can really see the detail um, when I slow down the beam. So we can see how those valves kind of look. And then I can just snap this and um, I can come back to chat and see what everybody's been talking about, if anything. Um, uh, let's see, so I got a question. Um, is it possible to see differences in exposure of, uh, to various chemicals like in the band patterns or similar cleavage sites? So um, 
the answer to that is actually sort of kind of. Um, when diatoms are exposed to toxic conditions like heavy metals, oftentimes they don't make their valves correctly. So where they would normally place something in the structure of the skeleton, the heavy metal inhibits that. And as a result, if they're exposed to a lot of toxic chemicals, um, the, the valve structures will be wrong. Like, okay, there's the way that this thing normally looks, and then there's a sort of um, deformed diatom that's produced. We call that teratological deformation, and um, it's usually associated with an environmental condition, um, like heavy metals or something, chemicals in some cases. And um, so this is a really uh, interesting question because one of the things that happens is that um, it seems like the damage is actually done at the genetic level, and then when the diatom replicates, um, the daughter cells have that same uh, deformity, and in fact, sometimes it'll go all the way through the cycle of um, asexual reproduction, so you have an entire clone line that has that deformity, and then when it goes through sexual reproduction, um, somehow that's transmitted, and even when they reproduce um, and switch back, sort of like hit the reset button, um, the reset diatoms will also be deformed. So um, in some cases, it can basically just um, cause uh, the continuation of those deformities throughout the entire line, like indefinitely, for a diatom. Um, so their initial exposure to the heavy metals could be really critical. Yeah, it's, it's actually kind of neat. Um, and then, um, yeah, you're right, pandemic, it, it could potentially then have even more sort of uh, mutations. But I think this actually how some of the, um, how some of the, uh, thank you for the follow red faction. Um, I think that's how they, um, uh, sometimes that's how they actually probably evolve. Like if it becomes a successful evolution, um, you know, it, it's, uh, if they get far enough away from the original. Um, so last night I was talking a little bit, if, if you were here the, uh, at my stream for the light microscope one about um, diatoms, or maybe it was the day before, um, diatoms that live in um, cooling um, towers from nuclear uh, waste nuclear power plants and um, uh, they had these sort of mutated structure looked really like part of the skeleton had been fused um, but they found them all over the place with the same sort of weird um, pores these really weird structures and um, and no other diatom has them they look like maybe something had happened to the skeleton but basically they stayed that way and they just kept replicating and um, and they eventually became something different so um, there's some evidence to suggest that they might actually be able to um, <laughs> uh, preserve those mutations and, uh, and, and be a source for uh, genetic recombination on, on some level. So um, this is Ellerbeckia. Uh, this is Ellerbeckia inerensis. Is it inerensis? Inerensis? Sorry numbering things to species level, um, a colony, and all of those things that you're seeing are diatoms, um, which are a type of golden brown algae. And these ones can't move. Um, they can just attach to things. Um, so they don't have a raphe. If they don't have a raphe, then they are stuck wherever they're growing. So, uh, and if they get detached like that one, probably it's going to be um, fatal. So that thing probably got detached. Um, it was most likely stuck on rocks that were either adjacent to the stream or within the stream that weren't completely submerged and, um, and would have been like um, pulled off of the rocks through high wave energy or water energy and, uh, and then left the colony behind and was adrift in the water um, being carried downstream. So uh, you know, very likely it was going to just get buried in some sediment somewhere at the end of this um, spring system, uh, a, a dammed reservoir or something like that. So um, here's a smaller version of that same thing, just a little short colony of Ellerbeckia. And it really, it's the only round things that we have in our sample, except for those sort of oval-shaped uh, cockanese, which grow attached to them. So. Um,
as I mentioned, I didn't really see any plankton, um, which I guess is a little surprising, but it's coming from a like a, uh, a spring, and I don't know exactly where they collected the water sample, but maybe it just didn't have time to develop a planktic community because of the short distance before um, where they collected it from the source of the spring. So um, it's kind of cool, though, to find flowing water with no plankton in it. Um, but it also means that everything we're seeing here probably was just on its way to being buried, so. Um, let's run back to the previous sample and see what we can find here. It's another one of these. I think this is our Gonfo monster. Um, you can see there's a little bit of junk still attached to the base of it because this was one that was not processed. And I think this one is the one I was looking at earlier today. It actually has, yeah, this is the Gumphanese um, that I call the horned beast because it has these weird horns sticking out um, from the front end of it. And let me show you what those horns actually look like because in the scanning electron microscope, we can see them very clearly at the right angle. So um, with a little bit of contrast help, you'll be able to see it's actually right in here. The horns basically um, split around the raphe. And then they just sort of stick up like little goat horns or a thorn or something. Um, so let's roll that around until it gets closer, then slow it down. And then I'm going to hit the brightness and contrast to try to get it to stand out a little bit more. Um, but they're right here. So here's one of them. It's like a little rosebush thorn sticking up. That's the raphe that runs around. That's how they crawl. And here's the other spine sticking up right here. So like a little goat horns um, off the top of their head. Um, and it's actually on the head pole. So um, very much like little demon horns or goat horns. Um, and maybe I should, if we name it, maybe I should name it like a demon. Um, wouldn't that be cool? Can we name it after like some sort of demon, demonic diatom. It's not demonic at all. They don't have any uh, kind of preference for anything other than substrates and nutrients. But uh, you should be able to see those sort of coming into focus right now. So there's one of those little thorn shapes like sticking up right there. Here's the... Uh, the end, the terminal end of the raphe, and there's the other horn, uh, thorn shaped horn sticking up, right? Pretty cool. And then uh, we can come down here and look at this one has uh, a single stigma associated with uh, the middle part of the diatom. So this is the, um, the proximal ends of the raphe and the um, the central nodule, which is what we call this, and then this sort of thickened bit of silica in the middle here is referred to as the sternum. So this piece that the uh, raphe runs into is called this, like like the chest, the sternum, and uh, and the raphe basically split those. One branch goes this way, one branch of the raphe goes that way, and then internally they're connected usually, and then this is our um, our stigma. An opening into uh, the valve face. And I don't really know what a stigma does, by the way. So um, before you ask, I have no idea. I don't know why it would want little horns. I don't have any idea what the value of that would be for the diatom, but clearly it must have some because they, um, they grew them. Um, and it doesn't seem likely that it's used for defense or anything. Yeah, inadvertently created some new life forms. So while that's scanning, I can come back. Um, yeah, it's an algae. Uh, Rebzoid, how you doing? Hanging out in our streams quite frequently now. Uh, well, I forget what the name of your, uh, your mushroom streaming is going to be called. So, um, you can, you know what I can do is, uh, let's see. We'll do this. That's not gonna work. I need to to know what your how your name is spelled. Hey, uh, 
Okay, the hell is Gulk? What does that mean? What's Gulk? 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 Um, uh, maybe Del could shout it out for you. How are you doing, Del? I'll do this. Give a shout out to my buddy Del Maximum. The Gulk? I don't know what the Gulk is. Gulk. Oh, Destroyer of Worlds. Oh, okay. Uh... It's a type of demon, apparently. Maybe. We'll do this. Bloop, 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 bloop. There you go. Perfect. There you go, Arbizoid. I made you VIP. You can, uh, you can shout yourself out now. <laughs> oh, okay. Gulk Gulkii, maybe we could name it. Confanis Gulkii. Can shout out your uh, your mushroom stream for us, so I don't have to remember the name anymore. Cause that's a lot easier. And uh, and also, if you're gonna do some microscope uh, mushroom stream, I can add you to my list of uh, streamers to do uh, microscope stuff. The squad. This is a Gomphanese. Uh, horned. This is the Horned Beast. Uh, central nodule. Pow. And um, that'll be a good one. Speed 4. Beam intensity 10. And now we can see things. Um... Let's go look around a bit more, see what we can find. So the next step in our process of describing this species, besides finding an internal view, which is my current quest that's not working out very well, is to, uh, well, one, to get some internal views of them on the SEM. I've got vowel views of both uh, diatoms now in the, um, in the SEM. And uh, so that's a good first step. Uh, external vowel views, and I've got uh, girdle views and uh, head pull, foot pull views. So um, for characterizing the diatoms, I really only need one more component, which is that in, uh, uh, internal view. And then um, if it turns out that our uh, sample from uh, the per generous person who went in the field <laughs> and collected some material for us, uh, uh, if any of those rocks that they collect work out in our favor and we have a whole bunch of this stuff um, then we would have to do some uh, measurements so what we would normally do is measure the length and width of the diatoms and we'd have to measure like usually a population of maybe 30 or something like that um, and then we might also do and I have been increasingly doing in my publications uh, associated with new taxonomy um, uh, a landmark analysis, which is basically sort of a statistical um, tool that we use to characterize differences in shapes. So we wanted to um, sort out whether it's an existing diatom or a new diatom. I could take uh, pictures of existing diatoms and characterize what they look like with this sort of shape software that, um, that we use to sort of... Uh, measure key points which are called landmarks and then we can use that to basically figure out are the landmarks the same from this one as a different species um, that has all of the same characteristics but they're not positioned similarly so we take the whole population we basically make a little uh you know a little key for determining what we think are important components 
and uh, it removes the influence of size. So it basically just takes the shape. And even though there are various sizes, we would know this um, same species at different sizes because it pretty sort of creates a continuum. And then we would look at other things that we think might be new species and plot them and see how their continuums uh, sit. And if they are in different positions where they're independent of each other, that's a pretty good indication that they're not the same species. So we can use that to closely, um, you know, species that are closely similar to each other, we can use it to distinguish them. And I've used that before, especially with Gumphanema, because sometimes it's hard with the Gumphanemoids to get a good sense of, um, you know, is this the same thing? Because they can be pretty um, variable. So, um, but it, it, if you can convert it into the robot tells me that these are probably, you know, the statistical robot tells me these are probably not the same thing. And visually, I think they're probably not the same thing because they have some different components or shapes or something. Um, then that's usually a good sign. And if the, um, the statistical package can't separate them, then we probably shouldn't be separating them, right? So it's a way for us to sort of determine whether or not we think um, that things are different enough to actually justify making them into a new species, which is sometimes a question that we don't know the answer to. Like, how different do they need to be to actually be different things? So this is sort of cool. We got an end-on view of um, the inside of a Ellerbeckia. So we've been looking at them from the side view. They look like a stack of cigarettes or whatever. Um, here we're actually looking at the end internal view of one of these. And um, what's cool about that is, of course, you can see they have poker chip-like margins right here um, that they stack up to create um, the colonies. And then the valve face has a set of sort of ridges, which you can actually see kind of through the diatom structure here because some of the silica got peeled back. This layer of silica got peeled back a bit, and you can actually see into that up here. So this is kind of cool. It's a broken valve. Um, it's like uh, we can see the into the actual internal structure of the um, cell wall now and uh, the joining poker chip margin sort of edges that are here we can see all all the way around those and then another cool part about this is if we zoom in we can actually see some of these little structures that are nested in the side wall right here See those little bumps sticking out? So right in here's one. And if I zoom out, here's one, here's one, here's one, and here's one. So these little tiny uh, structures that are sticking out into the inside of the valve. And if we saw the outside of the valve, we might actually see where those sorts of things would uh, be um, projecting into. So like, you know, what happens on the other side of them? Um, we don't have that view with us right here, but we could go back and look at those other ones and see if we could see a little difference in the way that they're um, situated on the outside where those little holes might be showing up. So uh, beam intensity we can fix to change our view so you can see how much higher the resolution is when we lower the beam intensity. And then I can put that right there centered more or less change this speed setting so that we get a nice clean image of it and then i can take a picture and then i can see what everybody's doing in chat again um let's see uh you vote for gulk okay we'll do it if we you know i don't think anybody will care uh, that's the cool thing about naming diatoms is that <laughs> minotaurus actually uh for the Gonfanese, that's actually also a good one, right? It is like a little minotaur. Um, Del Maxim says, my buddy is starting a mushroom business in Tennessee. Um, selling mushrooms? Is that what you mean? Like farming them? So they have these uh, commercials I see where they have like a, a, you buy a giant thing. It's like a colony of mushrooms and then, uh, and then you can just grow them and um and sort of farm them and it says you can kind of keep farming them for i don't know like 
five or six generations, they'll just keep growing mushrooms and growing mushrooms and you could eat them. So if you're like a hooked on mushrooms, you might do that. Um, yeah. Poker chip. <laughs> it's electrons. Yeah. Uh, I haven't used the micro manipulator today. I'm actually saving that maybe for Saturday. Um, I still need to test some things with it. So I need to also install OBS on the computer that the micro manipulator is on because it's in my microscope lab and I've actually never streamed from there. So um, Ribozoid asks, is the beam perpendicular to the specimen and can I angle it? Um, I can do something else. So hang on, uh, where's the controls? Where's the OBS controls? Let's take it out of studio mode. Uh, there. So you can see into the, uh, the chamber. What happens with the scanning electron microscope is the beam is coming out of this pull piece right here, and it's um, directly hitting our sample end on. And then uh, there's a little um, secondary detector out here that's collecting the electrons that are bouncing out of it. So your question is, can I angle the beam? And the answer is not really, but I can angle the stage. So I can rotate the stage, I can tilt the stage. Um, and so I definitely could tilt the stage and then the beams would be, uh, the beam would come in at an angle and then be reflected out at an angle. Um, that's easy to do. So um, when it's done collecting this image, I'll just show you um, how I could actually do that. I'll leave the internal view of the camera up here and then uh, you can get a good sense of it. So this is internal view of Ellerbeckia. And um, let's see, so it's, yeah, it's still showing the inside instead of my face, which is what I want. Um, and then um, if I, if I tilt it right now and I tilt it too far, it will touch some of these components internally and I don't want to make a, a connection between any of the metal pieces and my, um, my, uh, um, my electron uh, pull piece right here, the, uh, the beam pull piece. So what I would normally do in order to avoid that is lower the stage. So I'm gonna lower the stage. If you watch the little uh, image below, I'm gonna get rid of the picture so you can see the beam going on. Um, I'm gonna lower the stage down to, let's say, 17. So you'll see the stage going downward and this is getting vibrations and it's glitching out a bit because uh, the vibration of the actual instruments causing that defect to happen. And then um, what I can do is just tilt the stage. So uh, if I tilt it 10 degrees, um, you'll see that it's spin over. And um, again, the scanning electron microscope that I use, the Tescan Vega 3 model, is really cool because um, regardless of how far I tilt the stage, there's our Ellerbeckia. It is still in my field of view. And um, uh, if you're thinking about like, okay, it's tilting that, but uh, it's moving the stage in order to do it. Um, and I can um, keep that specimen still where it is, even though I'm tilting it. So if you're an old school um, SEM user, in the old days, you'd have to do all this manually. And when you tilted the stage, you then have to constantly reposition the stage so that the beam was still staying at the same place. Um, but you can see we can actually tilt the stage towards the, um, essentially towards the secondary detector if we wanted to. And um, then we had to just refocus it. We still have all of our things in our field of view, but now um, there's a bit of a tilt to the stage. So we're starting to see the backside of this um, colony of this uh, piece of the um, Ellerbeckia colony. It's not a colony, it's just an individual cell, but um, the outside edge of it. And we could just keep tilting it. I've had the tilt up as far as 60 degrees before. I don't know what the maximum for my machine is, um, but um, you know, usually I only like to tilt it when I have just one specimen on there, so I don't have a problem where the outside edge of my carousel might hit um, an internal piece. So the SEM is really good at knowing how far the distance is between um, the pole and whatever's directly under it, but it does not know like um, what you have on the actual carousel. 
So it can't tell what's going on with the rest of those components. And what you don't want to do is ram them into like the backscatter detector, uh, or especially not the pull piece that will destroy the instrument. So, but we can do that. And then we can also rotate it. So for example, if we wanted to, we could um, change the rotation and spin it around, um, you know, while it's tilted, you can see that occurring. And then now we're looking at it from another side. So if we wanted to look around like the outside edge over here or on this edge of it, we could just kind of keep spinning it. So it's actually kind of like a cool tool. And again, it keeps my Ellerbeckia in my field of view. So now we're kind of rotated around and looking at this edge rather than over here. So um, you don't tilt the beam because the beam is in a column and can't move the column, but we can actually tilt and, um, and rotate the stage as much as we like. So um, just as an example, I'm gonna put it back so I don't actually hit anything with my, um, <laughs> with my uh, stage because I'll forget maybe, and then I'll hit rotate and uh, it'll move it. Um, and then uh, um, I can also then move it back up. So uh, that's another positive about having it flat is I can get a lot closer. Um, if I just had one sample in there and I didn't have all the rest of those, um, I could rotate it as far as we wanted and, uh, and take a look at things from different angles. Um, we could actually just spin it around and uh, look at something from like a complete three-dimensional view if we wanted to. And um, I've done that before. So uh, we use that to build 3D models of diatoms by taking pictures from every possible dimension. So if we wanted to, we could, for example, look end on into these little processes and sort of see how they're shaped. Sometimes that's really critical for, um, for identifying something. And uh, I've done that before for some of my publications where I had to tilt it to some really extreme um, angles to sort of see into a diatom um, so that we could characterize it. These are really um, super frustrating views because this is a individual diatom with an internal view, but it got broke along the raphe. So I'm looking like internal at the side of the diatom, which is completely useless for me. I want to look inside of a diatom like this and not look into the side of it. Um, but I keep seeing this kind of view. So one of the things I thought I could do is just get a nice close-up view of uh, what's going on inside here. So I could at least have that. I know that's very exciting or compelling anyway. Um, I thought maybe we'd be able to see some of the stri. Um, but this is basically the outside margin of a diatom. So not totally useful. This is where the stri end on the girdle view, um, but we're looking at the inside of that image. So we're kind of getting a, a weird clipped angle. And I keep finding pieces like this that are like broken along the axis instead of being separated um, across the valves. Um, it's not particularly helpful. So again, I don't really even think that's worth like imaging because I'm not seeing anything there. Some other junk in my sample. I don't know what that is. Something organic. Closing in on three o'clock. Today I have a class that I have to be at. It's not one that I'm teaching, but I do have to be there probably um, at 4.30. Again, here's a nice weird oblique view into the inside of the diatom, but it doesn't look like it's providing us with a whole lot of useful information about what's going on, except for we can kind of get a structure of the sidewall here view. So for that diatom is dissolved. So earlier somebody asked me like about killing the diatoms and um, if they're actually dissolved or fractured like this, that means that they were, uh, they broke before I started. And it has, um, you can see this one's actually broken apart along that and there's both pieces of it right here, but I don't get the part that I actually need from it. So again, a little frustrating. Uh, Cause the one thing that I don't have that I need besides the size series is just a nice clean internal view of each of those types of diatoms that we've um, the sort of fan-shaped ones that we've been looking at, the Gumpha Monster and the whatever it was. Zolk? Volk? Uh, the Demon. Demon Diatom. Uh, 
um, normally when you name diatoms, this is sort of a f fun story, but uh, there's enough of them and um, you can be fun. They don't have to be serious names all the time. Um, and uh, there's some diatoms that look kind of like a condom that got named like Trojan uh, as an example. Um, you know, they, uh, they sometimes get named weird, funny things. And uh, diat diat diatomists have a good sense of humor. And uh, they'll just let you do it. People don't care, uh, you know. So uh, what you can't do, there's are some rules that you can't break that are associated with the um, taxonomic nomenclature code. And one thing I can't do is name a diatom after myself. So if I wanted to name one, um, I've got to name it after somebody else or something else or a shape or um, something along those lines. But it, it can't be um, it can't be named like Jeffrey Stone Eye. It, it can't be done that way. Um, if I wanted something named after me like that, someone else would have to do it. So this is sort of like a gentleman's uh, way of keeping people from just naming every diatom after themselves. Right? Is that we just make it so you can't name something after you. I could name something after my daughter or my wife, um, for example, but um, or my dog or my cousins, anything uh, except for myself. So and there are some uh, rules for how things get named, but generally speaking, that's the one that you can't break. And it only applies to, well, it mostly applies to plants, um, but diatoms follow the plant taxonomy code. Um, because that's where the algae go uh, with respect to taxonomy uh, decision making. So, um, last night I was doing some really sort of like late night for me streaming. I think we did like a like a 10.30 or something to 2 in the morning stream, which was kind of crazy because we had a bunch of raids that came in and we had some super generous uh, gift subscriptions that happened and um, it's a really fun sort of uh, setting. I don't, uh, I haven't been streaming from home very much because I just haven't had a lot of time at home. I've been just overwhelmed with work. Um, I don't... Uh, I basically spent the entire day on Sunday um, prepping lectures for this week. And uh, I've got two new preps that I'm doing this semester. So um, on top of all the other classes that I'm teaching, so it's just a ton of work. And um, uh, it's not a fun way to spend a Saturday or a Sunday. Like your whole weekend is basically sitting in front of a computer working when you don't get paid to do that. Um, you know, you're, you're just putting in extra hours to get things so that they're good for people and so that you can actually do your job. Um, but uh, I like my job, so I don't actually mind doing it. It's just like, it's exhausting and uh, cuts into my playtime, which I guess this counts as. Um, although technically I'm actually working. So for clarity, uh, I'm doing research right now. And some of the stuff that we're collecting right now will be showing up in publications. So um, keep that in mind, I suppose. So selling these, uh, these things have like a horn sticking off the front. You can actually see it much more clearly in girdle view. There's a nice clear look at the horn on this thing. Uh, this is our demon diatom. There's its horn sticking off there would be another one sticking off out here but it's in a pile of junk so we can't see it uh, but I can get a nice clean shot of it you can see both horns right here's one and there's the other and there's the raphe that's splitting between the two of them so all the same features we were seeing at before um, just a slightly different view of them and I think maybe I want to move that down a little. I went up instead of down, of course. And they're too far. And they're too little. There we go. That's what I wanted all along. And now I can 
line it up, do the thing, do the other thing, and uh, set it up to take a picture. And I'm going to do that right now. Click and take a picture. And I can come back and see what the, the, uh, what's been going on here in the chat. Um, again, me says, I totally need to read up because I have too many questions, but is it outside the, uh, rim for movement in their environment or temperature regulation? Uh, no, they can respond to temperature, uh, or light or nutrients. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, normally with a, an old school scanning electron microscope, it would, you tilt it and then you'd have to go find it again. So, uh, ridiculous. Um, some of them have been crunched a little bit. So no swear words in my diatom names. Yeah. I don't usually, uh, need to put any swear words in there. So, uh, dirty Smith asked, do you have to be certified to be able to name them? You mean certified like crazy? Um, no, but you have to have, um, you have to be able to, you know, publish them in a respectable journal, which means you probably need to know how to do the description. And usually that requires that you have a PhD, but, um, um, my students are authors on some of my papers and they don't have PhDs sometimes, many times, or even, uh, they're working on their masters, for example, and then we find something new and then they help me describe it. So they go on as authors. Um, and then, uh, you know, so that that's a possibility. I sometimes let the students do the naming or I give them a first shot at it. And then I tell them, well, we can't do that. Um, we have to do something more like this. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, the, the mushrooms are the same. They're stuck under the platinum plant nom nomenclature code. Um, a great way to raise research funds. Yeah. So, uh, again, he says, what is your area of interest in the sample currently being collected? It's just a taxonomic, straight taxonomic interest for me. So I, um, the sample was sent to me and my colleague Anna and I, and one of my students and another person who's a, um, expert in this group will name these as new species. So I'm interested in them because, um, she showed them to me and I was like, oh, those are cool. And then uh, we decided we should probably put a name on them, but we wanted to make sure that what we had was uh, a new species. So I sent off all of my images to a guy who mostly studies this group and um, particularly has looked closely at this, um, things that these are most closely related to. And, um, and then, yeah, we had a whole bunch of dialogue and he's decided that these are definitely new. So I just got an email before I started the stream where he was like, um, yeah, these are, I looked through all the old images that we have of these things, and this is not anything that's been a known species. So here we are uh, collecting images of it and um, whatever on Twitch, but I would normally be just doing this on the scanning electron microscope anyway. So you're, you're getting a glimpse of my actual workload. Uh, this is, I'm not doing anything <laughs> different except for when the pictures are taking, I can actually talk with people and, uh, and I got a camera and a microphone going on, so I don't normally have those, but otherwise everything is the same um, as my normal. This is what I would be doing. Um, on a positive side, I usually wouldn't make time in my schedule to do the SEM work um, if I didn't have time. Like if I was really busy, I would just be like, it'll have to wait. Um, even if it's something exciting and new like these, um, but, um, because I'm actually on Twitch and, um, uh, and I, I need to basically have some things that I'm looking at for content occasionally, um, there's an advantage, which is basically I force myself to get a little bit of extra work done. So you're in my, um, you're now in my workflow as something that kind of forces me to actually, um, get a bit of research done instead of just doing teaching. Um, which is probably what I would be doing, or maybe I would be at home sleeping at this point. Maybe I would have just given up on, um, you know, on my day and gone home and slept a little bit before my class that I have to be to at 4.30. So, you know, because I'm just like exhausted right now. So um, let's get that. I want to see how well this is in focus. This is probably fine. So six, seven, seven, bingo, picture. 
Um, but these are things that would likely end up being in published journals. So, um, a little thorn on the diatom to protect it from being attacked. You know, I don't know mind of a snail. I don't understand why diatoms might have spines and that spine. Oh, we'll see you alpha wolf. Um, that spine is in a really weird place. It's like stuck right where the diatom crawls. Like that's the head pull. So if it was going to crawl around, that's the part of the diatom that would be like, you know, it'd be like a plow or something. It'd be cutting into the surface. So I have no idea. It's not, it's not in a good place um, for the diatom. Feels like resolution seven. Um, so, uh, I have no idea. A lot of times people think the spines are like for protection, but I just don't see how the, those two little dots are protecting that. I mean, those spines are like little tiny thorns, but they are so small relative to the size of that diatom that I can't imagine that it's actually helping it, right? How is that helping anything? It's like, well, I was going to eat it. I have all these other places I could bite into it, but if I just bit it at that little top, the top part, then it would stab me in the mouth. Um, so I have no idea. It doesn't make any sense to me. And I feel like it's a great unqu unanswered question or people give an answer, but I don't believe it. Um, in, in the diatom world, it's like, well, why do they have spines? Like, what is the value of that? Um, on the bright side, though, um, if you're, you know, if you're this diatom and you're in the water, the, the foot pole would be down at the bottom and their little spiny heads would actually be up at the top. So if something was grazing, it might be something that would poke them. But I just, I, it's like so small relative to the rest of the diatom size. I can't imagine that it's actually defending them from anything. I mean, is that going to stop you if you want to eat a diatom? I don't think it would. So um, let's see. I should also, that was mind of a snail that made that comment. You're hanging out with us again like a champ. Um, so I'm going to give them a little shout out. Shout out to Mind of a Snail. You should uh, follow the Mind of Snail. They do great stuff and uh, fun to watch and listen to as well. So um, this is why I want to start streaming. Group responsibility. Yeah, you have like this pressure to actually get something done and, uh, and do a little bit of research now and then instead of just like relaxing, I guess. Um, say the jurgling says that the SCM process is weirdly similar to path of tracing and 3D rendering. You move the camera, you get a rapid noisy sample, and then you hit final render and it shoots the beam. Yeah. So, uh, we, we need to have the noisy version in order to move around because, uh, it takes too long for us to wait, um, wait it out. Right. So, um, we put it in the slower mode when we want a high resolution image so you're right it's similar to that like rendering process where if we want it to render we want to have the final version be nice and sharp um, and I could spend more time working on that if we had a purpose for it um, like we could have an hour and a half long photo um, that's super high resolution and very large but uh, I don't know why I would do that um, I don't I just don't have a reason for having a, that high quality of an image so this high quality of an image is good enough, basically, um, for publication purposes and for posters and um, definitely more than I need for the internet if I just want to put some pictures on Instagram. So um, the actual purpose of it is relatively limited. I mean, if I really wanted to, like, make a super impressive poster, I suppose I could do it, but I just don't, I don't see any other real value in it. That was the one that we were just looking at. A little fragment I think it's the side view that we were looking at why oh, I can never find one that's like uh, broken open where you can see the bowel face is a great question um, let's just look around a little bit more so probably by 3 30 I'm gonna call it a stream I was um, I was hoping to find an internal view, and it hasn't happened. Um, I'm going to probably rinse those samples a little bit more. And, um, and then try to mount some more material on here. And um, 
I guess then I'm going to be eagerly awaiting rocks that are going to be <laughs> mailed to me by someone I don't know. Uh, it's not the first time uh, that may have these things growing on them, and then we might have some really cool results. Uh, if it doesn't work out, if it turns out that the samples that they send me don't have what we need on them, it probably will still have some cool diatoms. So regardless, we might have something cool to look at. Uh, you never know. Uh, maybe I'll get some more new species out of that uh, funny incident. And, uh, and then I really would name them after those people uh, that collected it. So that would be fun. Um, and, and, uh, and then I know um, I have a, a standing bet. So this is important. Uh, with my friend Anna, I told her I thought these things would probably be living out there right now if somebody went out and collected some material from there. I told her that I thought it was pretty likely that um, that they actually would be found living, you know, like, or attached to rocks today. And, um, and we have a, uh, a bet because she told me she thought that they would only show up in the spring and that they wouldn't be there in the winter. And um, I told her I thought that they would be living out there now. So right meow, um, when the samples arrive, if we find these things that were actually like present on them and, uh, and living, I'm gonna get cookies out of the deal. So uh, I don't know if I can ship some cookies back to the guy who collected the material for us, but um, she was like, how are we gonna get a sample? Cause it's in the middle of Idaho and uh, and I said, I don't know, let me just try like seeing if people on Twitter will do it. And lo and behold, Twitter has apparently come through uh, with a win uh, or a potential win. And uh, if I get cookies out of it, that's even better. So this is a, there's a cookie challenge going on associated with this um, the sample collection process. And um, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna get cookies now. So that's all I'm gonna say about that. We'll see, but I, when it comes to cookies, I'm, you know, it's either she's going to be making me cookies or I'm going to be making her cookies. And I feel like even if I'm wrong, I'm probably going to make some cookies for me. So I'm going to get cookies either way. That's how I feel about it. But I also think it's going to be her making me the cookies. So we'll find out. And I feel like, uh, if I had more challenges where cookies were on the line, I'd probably get a lot more done as well. So talking about group responsibility, uh, the cookie responsibility is strong. Strong control on my decision making. This is another diatom. It is not the one that we've been looking for, but it doesn't mean we can't stop and take a look at it. It's a pretty one. So uh, the shape is similar to that of a Simbella or an ensinema. And if we look at the raphi, so this is this line that runs down the middle right here. Um, diatom valves, like whales or dolphins, have a back and a belly. So this is the dorsal side and this is the ventral side. Ventral means like belly, dorsal means back. So even, uh, even though they roll around on the raphi, we think of the hump as being their back and the um, the smaller sized um, deviation from the middle, the, the sort of belly hump um, to be the, the ventral side. And then uh, if we look at the raphi, this is the raphi of this diatom. And we follow it out to the logical end where it goes, the terminal end of it at the axis. What we see is that it's deflected. So it comes down, it's sort of wavy, it gets to here, and then it curls right around the outside edge of the diatom like this, right? If you think that's uh, uh, not real, that you think there's something else going on, you could always check the other side because the diatom should have some symmetry. And if we look at the other side, it's doing the same thing, right? I don't know if you can see that clearly, but here comes the raphi, and then it's got this like claw-like hook. It curls upward like this direction, right? So if this terminal end of the raphi is deflected towards the dorsal side of the diatom, it is the genus Cymbella. 
usually. The other thing that needs to happen in order for it to be a symbella, so we need to have this be deflected. We need to have it be, uh, have a clear dorsal ventral shape. So like the raphe is positioned closer towards the belly than it is towards the back and that the back is clearly arced. So like a banana or something, it has to have sort of like a, a, con a, a more concave side on one side than the other. And the other thing to make it a symbella is that it has to have an apical pore field. So you can see this one's broken, but it actually has a bunch of little holes right here that are not shaped like the striae holes, which are these sort of lineolate uh, or um, elliptical shaped things. They're round and they actually wrap all the way around. So the raphe's here and they're on the outside edge of where the raphe would be. There'd be a whole bunch of little holes here, like a salt and pepper shaker that would have an apical pore field, which means we are looking at a symbella. It's unquestionably a symbella and, and not any of the other things that it might be confused with, like ensinema, de, uh, delicatula, um, simbaplura. So it's definitely a symbella. This is like the genus, the way that we sort of define the genus and separate it from other things. In this group, that's a really critical component. Um, funny thing about diatoms is in some other groups, which way the terminal ends of the raphes deflect isn't actually that important. Um, and I don't know why. I don't know why we've basically placed so much weight on which way this thing bends when it gets towards the end um, for some groups, but for other groups, it's basically like, yeah, that's not a big deal. Um, I, don't, I don't know. And uh, when I ask people about it, they're like, because it's not a big deal, they don't really know either. So um, uh, maybe there's a genetic value to it uh, or a, like, um, a component of it that goes through the history of the organisms, like things split off way up high at which way the raphe deflects, um, you know, like in the genetic um, organization or um, uh, broad groups have that feature that does that, um, but it becomes critical. Another thing that's sort of interesting about Cymbella um, is that Cymbella have little um, isolated um, puncti or sometimes stigmoids that'll be present and they're usually present on the ventral side. They're not present on the dorsal side. If they're on this side of the, uh, the diatom, then um, we would be looking at Afrocymbella, which is a totally different group and it's not even closely related to, um, to the Cymbellas, it's more closely related to the Gumphodemas. So uh, kind of weird. Uh, some little thing like the, where the dots are and if the dots are up here rather than down there, it goes into a totally different genus and even a totally different like family. So, um, speed seven, beam intensity seven, hit the button and I can come see what people are saying in the chat again. Hello viewers, I'm back, uh, but I'm st you're still looking at the inside chamber of the diatom, so let me fix that. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> now you're looking at me again. Uh, I don't know, is it an improvement? It's basically the same on my side, so. Um, you think perhaps earlier non-horn versions were getting stuck to something? Possibly. I don't know. Uh, maybe the thorn is for mobility? A bit of grip? I don't know. Do diatoms have predators? Absolutely. Uh, everything eats diatoms. So just keep that in mind. They're like plants. They get consumed by everything. They would change the aerodynamics, like the flow dynamics. Yeah, that's totally possible. Pandemic? I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, banana time. Those curvy raphe, yeah, it's pretty curvy. Um, I remember this from the first stream you saw, apical pore field. Yeah, a, a couple of terminology. I've actually learned uh, some viewers who don't know anything about diatoms or didn't know anything about diatoms, uh, science, right? Uh, that's what I'm here doing. You're going to come out of this going, hey, I can identify a symbella from other things. Uh, I can tell what a gonfanese has. Uh, if you stick around long enough, you'll basically learn all of the genera, and then you could become a diatomist if you'd like. Uh, we could publish some papers together. Who knows? Um, you know, uh, maybe someone will get inspired and want to get a graduate degree in diatoms, and then uh, you can come work with me. Maybe you've got a microscope at home, and you'll see some diatoms and not know what they are, and then send them to me. And then uh, when I win a bet with you, you'll have to make cookies. I mean, who knows? 
uh, yeah, it's, uh, I'm just trying to uh, share knowledge without actually making you take a quiz or something, right? So we have some new followers, emotional support button, inquisitive minds. Well, that's a good name for somebody in here. And be buttercup with two P's and two B's. Uh, buttercup is my favorite of the Powerpuff Girls. So I don't know if that's, uh, if that's why you're named buttercup or if you're into like the flower or, uh, or what, but if you're named after the Powerpuff Girl, good choice. Uh, not to, not to shun bubbles, uh, comrade bubbles. I'm not saying bubbles isn't cool, but, uh, buttercup's better. Blossom, nobody cares about you. Go home, Blossom. Sit down, Blossom. Uh, it's almost triggering your uh, fear of holes. Well, I apologize, uh, Quirk Mark. Um, unfortunately, all we look at with diatoms are things with holes. So uh, you might be in a bad place eventually, but uh, this is too small for the holes to actually do anything to you. Um, in real life, these things are uh, the size of a speck of dust. You can't see them without a microscope. So <laughs> aren't we all things with holes? Um, yeah, I think that's accurate. Uh, jurgling. I don't know for sure. Bon bon five, five, six. Uh, there's so much bon bon going on. We've got a mama bon bon and a bon bon five, five, six. Things do crawl out of holes sometimes. Uh, and most phobias are irrational. Uh, but these holes are too small for anything to crawl out of. Like uh, some um, sugary substance called EPS can get squeezed out of them. Uh, it's like little bits of snot, but it can't hurt you. Uh, and, and you're more likely to get stabbed by gonfanema horns than you are, or gonfanese horns than you are to get squished by a little bit of sugar. Um, this is a symbella named like a symbol you know, like tsh, 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 that sort of thing, the, the little metal things that drummers hit. Um, I don't know what this species is off the top of my head, actually. So I'm just going to call it SP, external. Um, and then I'm going to close that. And we can go look around at some other cool things with holes in them. Why not? It's what we do in here. Is uh, Not everything we look at has holes, but... If you didn't like that one because it was a little too holy, how do you feel about this one? This one's pretty holy. It's a nice cockinese for you, all filled with little slit-shaped holes. Uh, that's what diatoms are, things with holes. And uh, when we zoom in really close, the holes become kind of cool. So hopefully it's not bothering you too much. I don't want to make fun of you. I'm just, uh, there's nothing we can do about it. If I want to look and do my work here, we gotta, there's gonna be some holes. There just is. Bear with me, I need to fix my stigmation just a little bit. I want perfection, and it's slightly less than perfection currently. So, stigmate. Oh, I'm changing this scanning speed for some reason. I don't want that, I want... I want stigmation. It's not giving me stigmation. Oh, here it is. Good enough. Let's zoom out. The holes bothering you yet? Uh, they could. Doot doot. Let's uh, fix the brightness contrast. This is uh, the genus Cochineus, or Cochineus, sometimes people say. Um, they're shaped like a little, I don't know, it's like a sled, you know, like a shield shield shape, shield, shield. And uh, on this valve, it uh, sticks out, concave, no, convex. And uh, on the other valve, it's usually a little bit concave, um, or maybe s sort of flat. And uh, this one doesn't have a raphe, but the other valve does. 
So they're called monoraphids because the valves have different kinds of um, presence or absence of raphe. And then over here hiding on the side is a little tiny amphora. It looks good. We're going to slap 7 and 7 on here for the speed and our beam intensity, and then I'll just take that picture. Close your eyes if you're afraid of holes. Let's see. Um, there's no mouths on diatoms. Um, they don't eat because they are autotrophs. They make their own food. Um, Jerkling's right, it's where the chemicals go in and out. So if they want to um, pull in some carbon dioxide from the water or um, phosphorus or nitrates, they need to have some way to exchange with the, uh, the water itself. So, um, uh, and sometimes they just need water, right? Uh, if they want to make sugary substances, they need uh, certain chemicals to do that. So um, it's a, it's a, but that, that actually that's a perfect explanation, uh, Jurgling. It's where the stuff comes in and out. Uh, it's not a mouth though. Uh, oh, thank you for this subscription, uh, Quark Mark. Um, uh, what did I miss? Yeah, extracellular polysaccharides are uh, EPS is what, uh, is what we're doing. Oh, uh, there's some conversation here. Um, good afternoon. Um, Holes make us whole. Some of them do. I, I need a hole to eat uh, and also to get rid of my chemicals. But uh, let's see. We're all just long tubes and Quark Mark likes telescopes. I like telescopes. I uh, like, uh, I think probably my favorite ones are actually microscopes though. Uh, telescopes are like, it's like a camera, microscope, and, uh, and a telescope. They're all kind of fit together. Yeah. That's how I feel about them. That's why I like SEMs and microscopes and telescopes and cameras. Those are my favorite toys. Um, you just started streaming with it. Oh, with the telescope. That's cool. Um, let's, I, I'm going to give you a follow cork mark. Um, I'm in the I think I can do it now. Hang on. I find you. I'll find you and follow you. Buttercup. Buttercup, you've got crazy hair. What is that in that picture on your uh, your page, your pagey thing? Uh, well, I'll have to find you later, I guess, because I'm busy streaming. But I will follow you, Quark Mark, and I want to check out your... Uh, you're going to show us quarks? You're just into quarks. Uh, stream manager. Oh, that caused me to lose all my chat. I'll have to come over here. Um, is a 10 frames per second video uh, possible? I can, if I set it on 10, so the um, that number that you're seeing, I don't think it's frames per second, is it? It's like uh, scan speed. Uh, it's 100 microns, uh, microseconds for each point that it sits on at seven. So there's like a value for it uh, internally. It doesn't mean like frames per second, but um, uh, but the um, the speed settings I can choose uh, go from one to 10. And when I have it on one, it looks like this. It's grainy, um, but it draws very quickly. So if I change something, it looks like a video camera and um, if I change the speed setting for two, uh, you can see sort of the, um, the beam scan sliding over it like an old fashioned CRT. I can still all also um, move, but you can see how it kind of gets jerkier when I move. And if I go to four, basically you can see it's scanning, right? And when I switch to seven, that's basically where we took that picture at. You can see it takes about three minutes to draw that image for us as the beam scans over it very slowly. And if I move it to eight, it turns into a 10 minute photograph. And if I set it on nine, it's a half hour photograph. And if I put it on speed 10, it's an hour and a half. So 90 minutes to go from the top of that image to the bottom of that image. Um, and it is possible. And um, 
sometimes if I have something really cool and I want to get a really high resolution image of it, I will change the beam intensity to something very small and then I will set it on nine and that's a half hour uh, photograph and I will get everything the way I like it and then I'll go to lunch and I'll come back and it's still taking the picture sometimes. So just to give you an idea um, of how long that takes and I, I suppose if I was only chatting um, with you guys and I wasn't really trying to look for other things, um, you know, one day we could do that where I just like, F it, we'll just look at this thing for the next 45 minutes uh, and I'll just set it on there. Um, but I would say generally speaking, um, that's not uh, that's not a setting that's conducive to people seeing what what's going on in the sample. They're going to be like, why is it still like drawing the same image after <laughs> 20 minutes? Uh, and it still hasn't finished it. Uh, so it's an option. Uh, it's just not a good streaming option if I want to show people uh, things inside the SEM. So um, sometimes I don't care, I guess, uh, but usually I do. So usually I'm trying to um, s s scan around and kind of showcase things that we can find cool images of diatoms or different views of them than we normally get. Um, so again, uh, we could ignore it. Um, I could go back to seven. I haven't been to seven yet. Um, this is one that I was looking at the other day, and here's a bunch of uh, Ellerbeckia. It's a lot of the same material because it's coming from the same sample. Um, so if you're wondering, like, why do we keep seeing the same kinds of diatoms? It's because um, all these came from the same sample. So here's the horn diatom again. This is our horned beast. I can get it into focus. It's a little dark right now, but you can see the little horns sticking off of the front end of it. They're, like I said, it's in a really weird place. Um, you know, it's not like a, a place where I would expect, like, like that little spine's really going to save you from being eaten. It doesn't even come out outside of your, like, you know, like, flat surface. So it's uh, confusing. Why? Why does it do that? I don't know. Uh... A question for the ages. And this is our other gomphonemoid, and we can tell it's not the same one. One, because of the density of the striae. Two, because it doesn't have a horn. Horn's missing, right? You guys can see that. This is hornless. And the other one is horned. Or I suppose horny. Uh, here's some more of those Ellerbeckia strands. And all this other junk that you see on here is plant debris and other um, crap that was in the water. And I've dissolved all of it out uh, and, and then uh, didn't rinse out enough of the acid for us to actually see the sample underneath it. So I'm going to have to, when I end this stream, which will be soon, uh, I'm going to go right back into the lab and uh, rinse the sample and uh, and see what I can do about um, having too much acid in it. And then I'm gonna make some more stubs and probably sneak back into the SEM lab again and uh, take some more pictures, but probably not till Saturday or maybe I can do it tomorrow afternoon if I can slip it in when no one's uh, expecting me to. And uh, I have a little break in my classes that I don't normally get. So, could happen. Uh, but probably won't stream it. If I find the thing I'm looking for all this time, uh, it will happen off camera potentially. That's what I'm saying. This is that Cimbello that we saw earlier, the same one that we took a picture of. Again, external view. Um, now I've got all this debris everywhere that I've got to search around. There's a big Ellerbeckia colony. So I'll probably take some of the photos that uh, we collected today and um, process them, colorize them, add some false color to them, and post them into the Instagram for my... Uh, oh my goodness. I am not... What are you doing here? Aren't you supposed to be at work? 
You just came to see if Mallory was here? Uh... What was I gonna do? I started to type a shout out to somebody. I don't know why I think I could shout out someone. Uh, solar al solar for algae, but chemical energy for some. Autotrophs, yeah. It's, it's uh, solar energy for algae, for sure. Uh, chemotroph if it's chemical energy, so. Turbop Slayer, welcome back. I saw you last night. Here you are. Came back to see what was going on. Extracellular, yeah. Uh, thanks for the follow. All the photos on my about me. Oh, I know what I was going to do. I was going to give you a link to my Instagram page. Pow. There you go. Uh, in case you want to see some of those things that are cycling in the, the uh, little slideshow sort of thing going on down there at the bottom. Patterns at the poles are neat. Yeah, that's true. Um, are there any mechanisms that we can see moving on the scale, uh, size and time? <laughs> you want you want a scanning electron microscope? Uh, well, they're a little expensive. So, uh, I mean, if you have the money for it, get me one. Uh, and then I can have one at home too. And, uh, and I'll show you how to use it. Whatever it takes. Uh, lots of cool stuff you can see with a scanning electron microscope. Uh, a little zoomed out. Let's zoom in. It's just like a uh, Cimbella Mexicana. So that's actually Mexicana or something close to it. For my good friend Del, who constantly sees Mexicana like uh, Cimbeloids in his microscope. And I'm sorry about this quark, but I really want a picture of these uh, holes that look like clover leaves up close. And. Uh, no amount of your fear is going to stop me from collecting that image, so. Let's see about getting it perfectly in focus. I think that's right there. And speed seven. Looks good. And I'll zoom out just a little bit. And maybe just a little down the valve so we get this kind of cool texture. In and out. Seven. Auto. Little X shaped pores are pretty cool. I think they're slightly dissolved. But um, usually the X's kind of come in a little farther. Oh yeah, that looks good. It looks sharp. So we'll set it. Let's set this to a speed eight, and our beam intensity just down to six, so we get slightly more detail. Maybe see the difference between them right there. And then I'm gonna hit take a picture. It's gonna give us a ten minute photo because I'm gonna end the stream. So, um, so I'm not going to think I'm going to find anything else. Uh, those X holes are bothering you. <laughs> sorry. Um, sorry, not sorry. Uh, yes, there are a bunch of chemotrophs that live in hydrothermal vents. Uh, that's actually exactly where they dominate. Um, you could start a service named diatoms after people like they do stars. Get a picture of diatom in the mail. Oh, honey, I have a gift for you. There's an untapped market. Um, you could be, um, so stars are cute, you know, you don't know if the, the one they named like XP257N0 got renamed Dirty Smith. Um, uh, you'd have no idea, like you just get a certificate, right? But in this case, you could actually get the species named after you and then your name would be stuck on that thing forever uh, and everybody would know it. So I suppose you could do it. You could monetize it. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, I think that's also illegal. I think that's another thing you're not allowed to do is like take payment for um, naming something. So, uh, but if somebody bought me an SEM and I named it for them, that'd be a totally different story. That's not taking money, right? What's the evolutionary benefit of the holes being X-shaped? I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. 
I think uh, there's got to be a value to it, but uh, I don't have an answer for you about that. I'm sorry. Um, uh, Jurgling says, I wouldn't think you'd need ionizing electron energies to do SEM. Um, well, we need to have um, our up at the top of our thing is an electron cloud being generated by a tungsten filament. And, uh, and then there's a series of magnets that focus the beam. Um, and you need it in order to get a beam of electrons that um, then knock electrons out of our sample when they interact with it. And that's what's drawing our picture right now. So um, every time you spray something, I must have missed that comment. Is it up there? Every time you spray something with electrons, it degrades. Yes, um, it does a little bit. So uh, if I left the beam sitting on this sample like overnight and I came back, electrons would be knocked out and they're actually degrading the sample. That is actually something that does happen. And in fact, um, if you watch uh, Freckled Science, she sometimes, oh, I don't think she can stream from them anymore inside her lab, but um, she sometimes used to stream from a scanning electron microscope and what she was doing was um, uh, sort of like laser ablation. They would zoom in onto an area and then, you know, gases are given off and they can capture the gases sometimes. So, um, but they would, it actually destroys some of the material. So it doesn't help me because diatoms, we know what they're composed of. It's silica for the skeletons. Mama Bon Bon, I wonder what color you'll pick for the image. I don't know. It's always a mystery. I never know what I'm going to do. All right. Uh, Jurgling says, have a nice day. Uh, thank you. I hope everybody else has a good rest of their day. Maybe I'll go out and catch some snowflakes and get you some images of uh, macroscopic images of snowflakes. You never know. Um, okay. So... <laughs> um, yeah, it just messes up the bonds for sure. Okay, so we need to find somebody to raid. And um, I have some common targets that I usually pick. Uh, Rams Reef is somebody that was following us last night um, that um, I started following. And I told them that I would uh, give them a check out what they're up to. So um, that's one. Right now they're looking at their reef tank um, they're looking at the sexiest shrimp on earth, a shrimp lord, apparently. So uh, let's give them a, a raid and, um, we'll stay with the aquatic science realm. And next time I'll maybe sneak in one of my artsy or musicy friends instead. So that is Rams Reef, uh, that will be raiding. Rams Reef. And hopefully you'll stick around with the raid, uh, but we're gonna bust in on Rams Reef and see what they're up to. And then uh, I'm gonna sneak back in the lab, rinse out the sample a few more times, and, uh, and probably we'll get back on the SEM um, tomorrow, we'll see. So maybe I'll stream it, maybe I won't, but um, uh, it's been nice for hanging out with you guys today. Uh, it's been great. I wanna say thanks to Corkmark for the subscription. And then uh, a bunch of followers, right? Buttercup, Inquisitive Minds, going back for a long ways to the beginning of um, the channel. We also had a nice raid from, um, from Five Ho or Shu, however you want to say that, brought in a nice party of people. Hopefully um, I entertained some of them for a little while. And um, uh, we'll catch you again um, next time, sometime soon. Um, if not on Thursday, then uh, we stream again from the SEM on Saturday afternoon, probably. Um, or I might do it like a night stream on Thursday or Friday. We'll see. So I'm a Bon Bon. We'll catch you next time. I'll see you. Um, if you're interested in other microscope streamers, you should um, check out the people in my squad, uh, the microscope streaming squad, including um, uh, Del Maximum, who was here earlier. He's one of my moderators. And Pacific Plankton, who's also a moderator for my channel. And OpenSet, who also moderates my channel sometimes. Um, but we're going to head off for the raid now. So um, we'll see you next time. And uh, goodbye.